Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're starting Unit 6, which is about thermodynamics. Now we know that chemical reactions are a very important topic in AP Chemistry and all of chemistry for that matter. Now in our last unit, Unit 5, we learned about chemical kinetics, which focuses on how fast a chemical reaction goes. We're going to be talking about to what extent a reaction goes in our next unit, Unit 7, that's equilibrium. Well, in this unit, we're going to be talking about why a reaction does or does not occur. And that's thermodynamics, the heat change that is associated with a chemical reaction. That's what we're talking about when we say thermodynamics. This is all about the energy changes that take place in natural processes. The, the thermo in there uh, gives us the implication of heat. Now, energy and heat are both measured in joules. This is the fundamental unit of heat and energy in the SI framework of measurement. Now, just so you know, in this course, we normally measure and we'll talk about energy and heat in joules. Just be aware that this is not the only unit that's available for us to use. You've probably heard of calories. That's another very good unit of energy and heat that we could use if we wanted to, to do that. Just be aware that if you ever need to convert, one calorie is equal to 4.18 joules. And so it's just a very simple conversion in order to do that. Now in unit six, we're not covering all of thermodynamics. We could spend, uh, honestly, years learning about thermodynamics. In this unit, we're just talking about the first law. Later on in this course, in unit nine, we'll learn about the second law of thermodynamics. Now, the first law of thermodynamics in this unit that we're talking about tells us that the total energy of an isolated system is constant. So it's certainly possible to transfer energy from one object to another, just thermal energy. It's possible to transform energy from one form to another. The fact is that in any chemical process, energy is neither created nor destroyed. So that's what the first law of thermodynamics tells us. We're not going to be creating, we're not going to be destroying energy in these chemical processes. Now, that being said, we are constantly transferring energy, transforming energy through chemical reactions. And in this unit, we're going to learn about how we do that and how we calculate those uh, those transferences or those transformations. Now, the word that, that we use to talk about how energy, or, or thermal energy specifically, heat, is transferred in these processes is called thermochemistry. And usually, when we say thermochemistry, that specifically refers to the first law of thermodynamics, and that's what Unit 6 is all about in AP Chemistry. Now, there are some things that we need to get straight, a few definitions, before we start jumping into this concept of thermochemistry and thermodynamics. We need to, to be aware that in any process or in any chemical reaction, we have the system and then we have the surroundings. We can classify everything when we're talking about a chemical reaction or, or even a physical process into either the system or the surroundings. The system specifically refers to the atoms, the molecules, the ions, whatever you're talking about, those, those particles that are actually participating in a chemical or physical process. So for example, if we have uh, for example, sodium chloride and it's dissolving. We're specifically talking about the sodium chloride and how it uh, breaks apart into its component ions. Those, that's the system. Now the surroundings represent everything else in the universe. And I know that seems a little bit lofty to talk about that, but that's, that's what it means. The surroundings would be everything in the universe that's not specifically participating in that chemical process or that physical process, whatever the case may be. That includes the air in the room around a reaction. That would be part of the surroundings, of course. That even includes 
the beaker or the flask or whatever container you're using in which the reaction is taking place. That, that container, that's not part of the system. It's part of the surroundings. And likewise, it even includes the water in the beaker in the case of an aqueous reaction. And so uh, this, is, this is a little detail here that sometimes even trips up rather experienced chemists because we have to remember that the system is only what's actually participating. The water in the beaker in an aqueous reaction is just the conduit. It's just the, the solvent in which a reaction is taking place. It's not actually participating. Now, if, if water is a reactant or a, or a product, then yeah, it can be part of the system. But if that's not the case, the water in the beaker, the solvent, it's actually part of the surrounding. So that's important to remember. Now, whenever we talk about energy transfer in a chemical system, a couple of ground rules. First of all, like we said in that definition of the first law of thermodynamics, in a chemical process, we're not going to be creating energy. We're not going to be destroying energy. Energy is simply transferred from one uh, place to another place. Or if we have an actual chemical reaction, we are perhaps perhaps we're transforming the energy from one form into another, like from heat and harnessing that and turning it into work. This one form of energy turned into another. That's okay as well. We, we realize that we can convert energy. Sometimes we have uh, light energy that is one form of energy. Sometimes it's sound energy. Sometimes it's mechanical energy, heat energy, different forms of energy. We can have one transformed into another, and that's perfectly okay. Now, in AP chemistry, the two types of energy that we, we think about and talk about quite a bit are heat and work. Heat and work. Now, when we say heat, I think we probably know what that means. That's the thermal energy. That's the ability of this, this energy to cause the temperature to go up or to cause it to go down in the case of a loss of thermal energy. On the other hand, work is the type of energy that allows uh, something to be moved over a distance. And so, for example, if I take a, a stapler that's on the table and I lift it up and move it to a different spot, I have performed work. It's a force that has been performed over the course of a distance. That's what work is. So we have two different types of energy here. Uh, they're both measured in joules, of course, in the SI framework of measurement, and they have somewhat different, uh, different purposes here. Now, when we talk about heat, we normally use the letter Q to represent that heat. Now, if a system gains heat, well, we would say that the Q or the sine of Q is going to be positive because the system is, well, gaining. And we know that gaining, that's a positive sign that's associated with that. On the other hand, if the system loses heat, that means heat is released by the system into the surroundings, then the sign for Q would be a negative value. So we're going to come back to that here in a moment. So gains heat is positive, loses heat is negative. Work, on the other hand, we use the letter a W to represent work. And I think that kind of makes sense, W for work. If you do work on the system, that means that the sign for work is positive. I think that kind of makes sense. If you have a house and you do work on the house, well, the, the net change in worth of the house is positive, isn't it? You've actually increased the value of the house. On the other hand, if work is done by the system on the surroundings, then work is negative. Uh, so we're going to use these signs here for heat and for work to calculate the change in total internal energy of a system. Now, this equation that you see here is the, is the equation for the change in the total internal energy. It's delta E equals Q plus a W. Total internal energy change equals heat plus work. Now let's try a couple examples with this. Here we have, in a system, 60 joules of heat are absorbed by the system, while the system does 50 joules of work. 
calculate the total internal energy change in this system. So once again, we're using delta E equals Q plus a W. So we're solving for delta E. Now the Q is the heat. It tells us that in this, in this process here, in this system, 60 joules of heat are absorbed by the system. That means that the system is gaining those 60 joules of heat. So that's why it's a positive 60 here. Now it says the system does 50 joules of work. Since the system does the work, that means that the W is a negative 50 joules. So when you add these together, you find that the change in total internal energy is a positive 10 joules in this system. That's how you solve these types of problems. Now, let's say we have this case. In this one, a system releases 100 joules of heat while 70 joules of work are done on the system. Calculate the total internal energy change in this system. So once again, we're using the same equation here. Delta E equals Q plus a W. But this time, we have Q. It says we are releasing 100 joules. So if the system is releasing 100 joules of heat to the surroundings, that means from the point of view of the system, it's losing 100 joules. So that's why it's negative. And for work, if 70 joules of work are being done on the system, well, the system is gaining 70 joules of work. So when you add these together, 70 minus 100, you have the total internal energy change for the system is negative 30 joules. So that's how you can solve these problems with total internal energy change. Now, when we talk about heat, there are, like I've said, several, several different forms of, of energy. Heat is one of them. And we can talk about different forms of heat as well. One very important type of heat that we're going to talk about in AP Chemistry is enthalpy. Now, enthalpy is the heat that's associated with the formation and breaking of chemical bonds in a substance. Now sometimes in chemistry, we just take for granted that enthalpy and heat are the same thing. That's not really the case. Um, enthalpy is a very specific type of heat. For example, if you take your hands and you rub them together rather quickly, you feel some heat generated, right? That's frictional heat. That's friction. Well, that's not enthalpy, okay? Enthalpy is not the same as friction. Enthalpy is a different type of heat. It's the heat that's associated with the breaking and, form and forming of chemical bonds. Now, when we say that, we need to, to realize that over the course of a chemical reaction, there's going to be a change in the heat that's present in those chemical bonds. The change in enthalpy is the amount of heat that's absorbed or released over the course of a chemical reaction. Now, the the symbol for enthalpy is H. And so change in enthalpy is going to be a delta H. And over the course of unit 6, we're going to learn several different ways to calculate the delta H for a reaction. In fact, if my calculations are correct, we're going to learn four different ways to calculate delta H. So hang on, because we're going to be learning about that over the course of this unit. Now, most of the time, when we have a chemical process, we are releasing energy. That's how most reactions are. Well, you need to be aware that anytime a chemical bond is formed, heat is released. Enthalpy is released. That is an exothermic process. On the other hand, when a bond is broken, it requires the absorption of energy. It's an endothermic process. Now, I want to point this out because a lot of students out there sometimes get these confused. And somehow they um, have a misconception that somehow when you break a bond, you're releasing energy. That's not how it works. It's not like a chemical bond is like a magical glow stick where you break it and all of a sudden you know something pops out of it. That's not how it works. To break a bond, you have to invest energy. It takes energy to break a bond, just like it takes energy to break a pencil or to break a ruler. It, you have to invest energy. It's an endothermic process to break a bond. When you form the bond, that's when energy is released. Now, we have a couple words here that you've probably seen before. 
exothermic and endothermic. The word exothermic specifically talks about reactions or, or processes we are, where we are releasing heat by the system into the surroundings. So that means that if you put your hand next to an exothermic process, your hand is going to feel hot. So most chemical reactions that we're familiar with are exothermic processes. Things like a flame burning. You put your hand next to that, it feels rather hot, doesn't it? The surroundings are getting warmer. On the other hand, endothermic is the opposite. That's when the system is actually absorbing heat from the surroundings. And since the system is absorbing heat from the surroundings, if you put your hand next to the next to a, a beaker or something where an endothermic process is taking place, it's going to make your hand feel cold. The surroundings get colder in endothermic processes. So I think intuitively we understand that, that you know, exothermic is, is where it feels hotter, endothermic, your hand is going to feel colder. So this is a little introduction to the concepts and some of the vocabulary in the first law of thermodynamics. Join me in the next video where we're going to move on to unit six, section two. Thanks for watching.